Okay, Mr. Watson here, and in this video we're going to look at social facilitation. So we have social facilitation and social inhibition. Okay, they're our two key terms. So we're looking at the influence of the presence of others on performance and how it may help or inhibit performance. So social facilitation is the positive influence of others. So people like the audience who are watching, uh, teammates, the coach, and the audience helps them. They facilitate an increase in performance, okay? So they help them. The athlete likes it. It just has a positive effect. Opposite to that, social inhibition. The audience or the others around them, they have a negative effect um, on the athlete, and that leads to a decrease in performance so quite simple to start with their social facilitation is helping social inhibition is not helping okay so obviously we had the word others in that statement and what that means is audience and co-actors so co-actors a little bit of a weird one but it's very simple okay so you got the audience that's the spectators or the crowd the people who are watching you okay and then the co-actors are the other performers, so the people on your own team and the people you are competing against. So really simple, just like to be called co-actors, okay? So we're going to start and look about where this came about. Now, with CIE syllabus, we need to know about Zionk, okay? However, it's very important to start with triplet, even though it's not in the syllabus, because his work paved the way basically so we're going to take a look at this first so triplet provided the earliest studies in this area and like i've just said they paved the way for others such as zion to do their research so what triplet did is he had a group of cyclists or a group of people and gave them cycling activities and just he had three groups in his experiment and in his first group he had a cyclist who had to go around a track alone and unpaced. So they might have had their PB in their own head, but they had nothing to pace against, okay? So they would just cycle alone around the track. In group two, the cyclist would go be paced against time. There would be a bike on the side, and this bike would go around of his pace of his previous time. So he was paced against time. And in group three, competition so what we just know as a bike race okay and what triplet found was that performance improved consistently under all three conditions so as they kept repeating people kept getting better but what he specifically noticed was that the paced times were faster than unpaced so groups two and three were getting faster times than group one and group three was getting a faster time than group two and what he said was is that this competitive instinct was the main factor and it was because other cyclists were there so there were co-actors and these co-actors these other cyclists they facilitated they helped achieve a faster pace a faster time so they had a positive influence on performance okay so then we moved on to zion um, and what he did was he actually did one of his first experiments um, with cockroaches, okay? And in this, he had uh, one group, uh, task A, task B. And in task A, the cockroach had to escape the light and just run straight in a straight line. And if you imagine in your minds now a cardboard box, the cockroach is in four corners watching. And then in the other group, um, the cockroach had to turn a corner to um, escape the light. So we've added in task complexity, but we'll come on to that. Um, but one of the main findings of Zionk, okay, I was just giving you a little backstory there, is he said it was down to arousal. So we're going to show up here dry theory, okay, but we need to be very specific about what we say about the dry theory and remember from AS, okay, it's got to be accurate. So the first thing Zion said was the presence of an audience, so the presence of the other cockroaches, okay, it increased the level of arousal of a performer. 
So if there are people watching you or you're playing with people, you're racing against other cyclists, okay, your arousal will increase. That's the first thing he said. The second thing was that this increase in arousal makes it more likely that the performer's dominant response will occur. So it may lead to high performance, but what he was saying is that when you have high arousal, you'll use your dominant response. And what a dominant response is, is a skill that's well learned. Okay, you're in that autonomous stage, it's well practiced, you've rehearsed it, you've done it a lot of times before. So when your arousal's up, that's what you're going to do when you're reacting to the stimuli. So they were his first two simple statements. But he went on to say something else, obviously with the cockroach as I mentioned, task complexity. Zion said, if the skill is simple, like a gross movement, or if the performer is an expert, the dominant response is likely to be correct. So this is where high performance might come in. So the first statement he made in point two, he was just saying that you'll show your dominant response. Whether that is correct or not comes down to task complexity and the ability level of the performer. So he's making relationships between the two. And we've seen this before with arousal. So if the skill is gross or simple, okay, you're likely, your dominant response is likely to be correct and performance will improve. If you are an expert, you can probably do more complex skills and your dominant response is likely to be correct, performance will improve. On the other hand, if a skill is simply complex, the audience, the co-actors, you can inhibit the performance. The dominant response is likely to be incorrect and performance may decline. And similarly, with a novice, a beginner, someone who's still in that cognitive stage, they're thinking about their technique. If they're having to think about co-actors and audience, their dominant response is likely to be incorrect and performance may decline due to this audience and this inhibition, this raised arousal. So this is what Zayung said. Zayung was big on arousal and its relationship with social facilitation. However, Cottrell came along and he used this term evaluation apprehension. So Cottrell stated it was not the presence of the audience or the co-actors alone that raised arousal levels. And he actually said something different. He said the presence of an audience had a calming effect rather than raising the arousal of the performer. However, what he did say was that if the audience was there to judge them or evaluate the performance, then that raised arousal. And this led to something called evaluation apprehension. You're a little unsure about performing in front of an audience because you were fearing being evaluated. Okay? So... Here's an example, a scout, okay? So if you have a football team and let's just say the England scout says, I'm going to come to your school, your club and watch your players, you have a choice then. Do you tell the players the scout's coming to watch? It may cause um, high anxiety, arousal, they may become over aroused and it might affect them negatively. They might have evaluation apprehension. But on the other hand, if you don't tell them and they're a bit too relaxed and casual, they might have wanted to know. So arousal level will increase if an audience is there to evaluate or judge you. So this is what Cottrell was saying. So what we're going to look at now is the effects of social facilitation on performance. And similarly to arousal, we're going to look at some of its relationships. Okay. Now. The first thing we're going to look at, okay, is home field advantage. So some people, as we know, regardless of whether they're home or away, will choke in front of an audience. Some people will rise to the occasion. But what has been found is that, and it is a fact, teams win more often at home in their home stadium than they do away. Now, I have to say, the percentages aren't as high as you might think, Um but it is, I have to say, it, it, is a, it is a fact, okay? So, here's a little example. Liverpool 
Um, obviously, everyone knows dominating football at the moment. But here's a clip back from 2018 where it was getting labelled as Fortress Anfield, Anfield being the name of their home stadium. And Liverpool didn't concede a goal for 841 minutes at home. And as you can see, the results there, they're incredible. Okay, So they have this home field advantage phenomenon happening. They're more dominant at home. So why was this home advantage facilitating their performance? Well, one, the crowd's more sportive. Quite often in football, 90% of the crowd at the home stadiums are there to support the home team. Familiar surroundings, they're in the same changing room. They probably live in the city. They don't need to travel much. They're well-breasted, okay? They know everyone. They know the ground staff. They're just familiar with everything, okay? And the crowd might be hostile towards the opposition. They might give them a bit boo. They might intimidate the opposition. Um, so having a negative effect on their performance. However, if we were to get a question on this where we need to analyse, it's important to know that how the home crowd can cause social inhibition. And how that can be done is there's greater expectations. We know that it's a fact teams win more at home, so that becomes an expectation. Then 90% of fans are paying the money and they expect to watch you win, okay, more often than not. And secondly, just like the last slide, evaluation apprehension. That crowd know you well. They'll be judging you. They'll probably be making vlogs. They're the in thing. They have these fan vlogs. If you've had a bad performance, you might be the center of attention on that vlog. So social inhibition can occur also with the home crowd. Now let's look at other relationships. Now I'm not going to spend too much time explaining these because we've gone over them on arousal and I have to say a lot of them are straightforward it's not new knowledge okay so fine controlled movements arousal from the audience may inhibit performance so in snooker where you need to have good cue utilization you know you need to focus in on the ball you're trying to pop you need to understand the white ball a rowdy audience is probably going to affect you unless you're an expert okay so fine control movements as we know from Zion, we're linking back there, can inhibit performance. Simple and gross, as we know, can facilitate performance. You often see in the high jump, when the athlete's going for a PB, the audience will start clapping, gearing them up on the runner, then they'll go silent, hoping the bar doesn't fall off. Personality, probably guess this one from arousal. Extrovert, because of that RAS system, you know, inhibiting that stimulation from sensory stimuli, they seek arousal and audience can create higher arousal, as Zion said. So extroverts are going to seek that. Introverts, as we know, they have internal arousal. Their RAS is intensifying the stimuli, so they'll tend to shy away from social situations. Okay, thinking back to I think what he was saying, and because you know they have high internal arousal. Ability level, again, back to Zion, as we know, if they're highly skilled. Their techniques are likely to be autonomous, meaning they can deal with higher arousal. Higher arousal coming from the audience, it can spur them on social facilitation. Beginners, dominant sponsors, responses, sorry, are likely to be incorrect. You know, they're still learning the skills, they're in that cognitive phase. Any other distractions are going to take them to possibly an over-aroused state, causing social inhibition. Previous experience, experience can mean two things. Let's start with this one. Previous success, if you've won in front of a crowd before, you're not going to be bothered about doing it again. You might actually be quite excited about it. I enjoyed that. I loved it. You're more likely to do it again. Previous failure, if you failed in front of a crowd before and you felt like you wanted the ground to swallow you up, you might not have enjoyed it. And if you're going to have to do it again, you may expect to fail again. You'll have anxiety about performing in front of the crowd. Also, experience can mean this. If I've been playing basketball for 20 years, I'm more likely to enjoy a crowd or the crowd's not going to affect me. But at best, it could facilitate me. If I've been playing for two matches, I might experience social inhibition. Move on to crowd knowledge. This is probably one where it can be a bit tricky. So if the crowd is knowledgeable, they might show you empathy. They might understand you. They might be your home crowd. They might 
make you feel well supported. They know you're a human. They've seen you play well for the previous weeks. They know you're just having an off day. Okay. However, the crowd can be that knowledgeable. They're evaluating you. They know a lot about the sport. Usually people who go to watch sports like tennis and snooker, okay, they know a lot about the sport and they're there evaluating your performance. So increased knowledge doesn't always mean social facilitation. It can increase evaluation apprehension, linking back to Cottrell. Then we've got the people you know. You might be proud. People you know are coming down to watch you. You feel proud that they've come to watch you. They facilitate your performance. They increase it. On the other hand is, you might be anxious. You've got a bunch of people coming to watch you. all know you. If you so happen to make a few mistakes, everyone's going to know. Anxiety goes too high. It hinders your performance. Social inhibition. And the final two, the nature of the audience. As we know, we link back to this on Attitude in my Attitude video. You know, in Serbia, when they're walking down that football tunnel, strikes fear. If you've got a hostile and anxious crowd, it can lead to social inhibition, okay? However, there are individuals who love it. They will thrive in that. They love being the bad guy, and it just increases that knack in them, that drive to succeed, okay? And finally, we've got proximity. How close are the audience? And this one can go two ways itself. You might feel like they're too close. You're taking a golf putt. You feel like the crowd are on top of you, okay? However, it might assure, reassure you. You might feel comfortable. It might calm you. Um, so that can go one of two ways with how the proximity of the audience. So this is one way you might want to pause. I have kind of skipped through it, but that's because we've gone through these with arousal and some of them are pretty straightforward. Some of them are not new knowledge. And just to finish off there, I'm aware this is a long video. Please rewind um, and pause as you need to. We're looking at strategies to minimize social inhibition. So obviously this is important for players, for coaches, um, to stop them choking uh, in front of an audience, in front of co-actors. So looking at coping with the negative effects of an audience, well, like we covered in anxiety, anxiety management, arousal management. If you are the coach, you give the knowledge of the benefits of relaxation using imagery, visualization. If you're in a hostile crowd, use imagery. Pick yourself you're on a beach or use mental rehearsal, visualization. Go through the skills in your head. Conor McGregor is a classic example and his coach, Coach Kavanagh, talks about this a lot. It's like Conor's already lived the fight before he does it. That's why he thrives on the crowd so much and gets social facilitation. He uses intense imagery in the build-up to the fight. Open training sessions, um, you know, you'll often find in pre-season in UK football, you know, they'll invite the crowd down to watch training, you know, they're trying to sell merchandise, obviously, but they are doing it to get their new players. If you've just got a bunch of new signings, you know, let's get open training session going and invite the media down and let them watch, okay? However, there is a time when that could be a problem and that's if you've got complete beginners now it's sometimes better that you allow your beginners to learn new skills in a non-evaluative atmosphere okay and it's a long video struggling to get my words out now but a non-judgmental atmosphere so if they are a novice couple of sessions in that might be the way decrease the importance of the event so in the uh, the image there we've got Jurgen Klopp with his arm round Trent before his debut. Just, you know, telling him to go enjoy his game. He doesn't need to worry about whether Liverpool are going to win or not. Just go out there to your first match. Enjoy yourself. So decrease the importance. And finally, support from other teammates. You know, Gerard passing the captain armband over to Henderson there. Just letting him know that, yeah, I'm the existing captain, but I'm here to support you. The crowd are here to back you. Okay, so if you look across and a teammate showing a bit somatic anxiety they look a bit shaky just go and let them know things are going to be fine you're there as a team good cohesion support them okay guys so that's a quite a lengthy video okay but i feel like some of it is not new knowledge hence why i've kept it as the one video so please pause rewind do as you please with it and i hope you've got a lot out of it thank you